Bom dia, uh, bem-vindos à terceira aula do curso Brasil e Palestina, fontes de identificação. Uh, como vocês foram enviados, uh, informados pelo e-mail enviado pelo nosso monitor, o Alexandre, uh, o professor que estava agendado para essa semana, ele teve um, um problema de saúde, está uh, se recuperando, está sendo tratado, mas a aula sobre os refugiados será passada para um momento futuro. So, uh, because uh, Adnan Abdelrazek's class was postponed, we were lucky and very fortunate to be able to invite uh, Professor Haider Aid from um, the Al-Aqsa University in Gaza. He was uh, very uh, kind in accepting our uh, invitation on such a short notice. So here he is. Thank you very much for, for being here and for uh, providing us the view you will bring today. A, a short uh, uh, um, bio on, on uh, Professor Haider Heid, Aid. He is Associate Professor of Postcolonial and Postmodern uh, Literature at Gaza's al University in Palestine. Uh, he has published papers on cultural studies and literature in a number of journals uh, and books. He has also written widely uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He's also a policy advisor at the uh, Ashabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and on the advisory board of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. His books are Worlding, uh, Worlding Postmodernism, Interpretive uh, Possibilities of Critical Theory and Countering the Nakba, One State for All. Uh, his new book, Decolonizing Palestinian Mind, is to be published this year by Left Word Books. So, thank you very much, Professor Haider Age, and all uh, the floor is with you. Thank you so much, Erlene. I really appreciate it. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be with, with you and with your students at um, Sao Paulo University. And um, I would like to open, uh, you know, open my class with uh, a sort of a personal note about myself, since before we started um, this class, I was talking uh, to you, Aline, and, uh, and your students. And uh, I need to make it absolutely clear that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm based in Gaza, by the way, as uh, Dr. Aline has just mentioned. I'm based in Gaza, and I'm also a Palestinian refugee. So I think um, um, and it's important to personalize my experience before talking about, you know, the siege of Gaza and the situation in Gaza right now. Because most of you will, um, will notice that I, um, I refer to the South African experience whenever I mention something about Gaza in, in particular and Palestine in, in, in general. I, um, I, spent about, um, I spent about five to six years in, um, in South Africa. And the first time I arrived in South Africa in order to enroll in the PhD program at um, uh, University of Johannesburg. It was in, back in 1997. And so it was three years after uh, the first democratic, <clears throat> excuse me, non-racial elections taking place in the country. That was in 1994. And three years after the election of Nelson Mandela as um, the, 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 the first black South African, uh, the first black president of multiracial and multicultural South Africa. So the country was still living, you know, the turmoil of um, apartheid and resistance against, against apartheid. And to me, that was extremely important because it, it managed in a way to provide um, a sort of a political vision, an example a model for us here, here in South Africa. And when I got my PhD degree in 2000, I decided to come back to Palestine. And that was the beginning of the second intifada, the uprising. Uh, and I spent a year teaching at another university, Al-Quds Open University. But then I decided to go back to South Africa and spend some more time there. So now I just needed to give you this background about my South, South African experience so that you, you don't find it strange that I always refer to South Africa in terms of the comparison between uh, apartheid in South Africa, uh, representing white supremacy th there, and apartheid in Palestine, re representing Jewish su supremacy here in Palestine. 
So that was something that I really uh, wanted to, um, you know, to, to, to say. Uh, when I was contacted by, uh, by, by my friend Arlene, we discussed, in fact, the topic in general. And um, we decided, because it was a very short notice, in fact, um, I knew about this class around only three days ago. So I couldn't prepare even, you know, um, uh, slides to show you here on um, on some I'm sorry about that but um, you know I decided to give a situation in in Gaza where I'm residing right now from the horror of the medieval blockade that has started back in 2007 and the four wars of aggression um, um, by apartheid Israel the war of 2000 war on Gaza not war between us and Gaza, it was a war on Gaza, an aggression, a war of aggression on Gaza in 2009, in 20, 2012, 2014, and 2021. So I decided to do that and then move to the necessity of international intervention in the form of BDS boycott, divestment and sanctions, as the most effective tool of solidarity with the Palestinian people. This is one of the most important lessons um, that we have learned from um, the South African struggle against apartheid. And I wanted also, and I want also to allude to how to avoid normalization. Normalization with apartheid is the same way governments and ordinary people avoided uh, normalizing apartheid in South Africa. And what we expect from the international community, we inter expect the international community, ordinary citizens of the world, to heed the BDS call made by Palestinian, uh, Palestinian civil society. And if you were more interested, I think, you know, uh, I can tell you my personal view uh, about, you know, the, the political possible political solutions that, uh, that we need to have here in Palestine, solutions that provide us with justice. And I can add my two cents later on, but um, I need to start by talking about, as I, um, as I promised uh, my friend uh, Arlene, by, uh, you know, by talking about Gaza, but uh, I also say the way I'm also an activist, so sometimes, um, I think it's good and I think it's bad. So I, I, when I talk, I talk like, a, you know, an academic. And I remember that, you know, people are not used to dry this. But let me start by playing the role of, a, of, the, of the academic. And, uh, and I think one of the things that academics like to do, they like to start by quoting you know, high, high profile. And one of my um, favorite philosophers um, happens to be a Jewish philosopher, a person I respect a lot, Walter Benjamin. And Walter Benjamin once said, and I'm quoting, there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism, end of quote. And obviously, this class now, is about the barbarism of apartheid, settler colonialism, and military occupation in Palestine. But um, it's also about our resistance. And that is what I'm also going to allude to. Um, in, in, the, in the last 14 years, uh, starting from, um, I would say, um, 2000, 2008, 2009, uh, until today, Israel has launched four massive wars on the occupied Gaza Strip. And here I'm talking about only the Gaza Strip. And you can, you can have a look at the map. And the Gaza Strip is only, it's an area that is 360 square kilometer. It is 1.8%, 1.8% of historic Palestine. And uh, Israel has decided to punish us for reasons I will I will I will uh, talk about. Uh, many of our civilians during these massive attacks were massacred in broad daylight by Israel's indiscriminate bombing 
which, by the way, was condemned by UN experts, leading UN experts and leading human rights organizations. I'm talking about, you know, the likes of Richard Falk. I'm talking about, you know, Amnesty International. I'm talking about Human Rights Watch. Even Israel's human rights organizations, from Gisha to B'Tselem, all have condemned Israel's war crimes um, against the, the population of Gaza. UN experts, and I'm quoting, call them war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. Now, these four assaults uh, left over, I would say, I'm, I'm trying to add, you know, the, the, and I hate talking about figures and numbers because has friends, has, has a wife, has, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And these assaults on Gaza have left more than 4,200 4, Palestinians dead within the last 14 years, years only. And predominantly killed by apartheid Israel were civilians, of whom hundreds were children and more than, more than um, 16,000 Palestinians were injured. So we, we are about 2.4 million. The population of Gaza is about 2.4 million. The 2.4 million uh, Palestinians in, in, in besieged, blockaded Gaza, the overwhelming majority of us, by the way, are refugees. I myself, um, I am a son, I am a refugee. I'm a son of, uh, of refugees, of refugees. Uh, my parents uh, both are from the ethnically cleansed village of Zarnuga, which is part of Israel now, and it doesn't exist anymore. It is completely wiped out from the map by Zionist, uh, Zionist gangs in 1948. Both of my parents became refugees, uh, moved to the Gaza Strip, um, lived in the uh, Nusayrat refugee camp where I, where I was born. Both of them died in 2005, dreaming, holding to their key, uh, the key of their house in, in, in that ethnically cleansed village, dreaming of the day when they would be allowed to return to, to Zarnuga in accordance with United Nations Resolution uh, 194. I mean, my parents and all of us refugees, by the way, 80% of the population of Gaza are refugees entitled to their right to uh, their right of uh, their right of return this is you know a basic basic human right that we cannot compromise on we cannot give up on and i, I let me go back to the assaults uh, this uh, i just you know dev deviated a little bit just to give you a context of you know of Gaza and the population in Gaza. So the the Israeli assault you know left more than sixteen thousand dead. Uh, sorry, more than uh, four thousand dead, more than sixteen thousand injured, and um, as I said, most of us were expelled and dispossessed uh, from our homes by Zionist forces in nineteen forty eight. In 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 for example, in two thousand and nine. 2008, it was December 2008 and January 2009, we were subjected to three weeks of relentless attacks. In 2012, two weeks of, the, of, 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 of an aggressive war um, against Gaza. In 2014, Israel spent 51 days against the, uh, attacking the, the population of Gaza. And as if that was not enough, because we did not give up, they decided to come back just two years ago, a couple of years ago, in 2021, and spent seven days attacking the area, especially the area where, um, where I live. Um, leaving more than 200 people, um, more than 400 people did, including 60, 69, 69 children. Um, they used, you know, Israeli war planes made in the United States of America. I'm talking about F-15, F-16. Um, 
Israeli war planes systematically targeted um, civilian infrastructure, um, bringing the civil infrastructure to rubble, and destroyed tens of schools, academic institutions, schools, factories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you name it. Um, and these wars came after years of an ongoing crippling, deadly medieval siege. It is still going on, of course, uh, which is a severe form of collective punishment according to major human rights organizations and according to the International Committee of the Red Cross. So the international community knows very well that what Israel is doing to the Palestinians of Gaza, in addition to the military occupation, to settler colonialism, apartheid, is another form of collective punishment. And just to remind you, and I'm sure most of you already know this, uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, ratified by Arthur itself, the punishment of a civilian population. Now, this, we need to be clear about that. In, in, in 2009, <coughs> excuse me, in 2009, the, the UN fact-finding uh, mission on uh, the Gaza conflict, this is what it is called, and I don't know why they call it Gaza conflict. Uh, there is no conflict here. I mean, we, you, we don't have two equal sides to call it a conflict. But anyway, that's what it is called, UN fact-finding mission of the Gaza conflict, headed by, um, headed by uh, uh, the highly respected South African judge, uh, Richard Goldstone, found Israel guilty, guilty of war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. And I'm quoting, by the way, war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. These are the words of Judge Richard Goldstone hitting the UN fact-finding mission on the Gaza conflict. These are not Palestinian words. These are international comments um, after the investigation on what had happened to, to the people of Gaza. The same thing was repeated by major international human rights organizations, as I said, such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc., etc. Now, the thing is, Israel did that in 2009, the international community, this is why apartheid Israel, repeated the same scenario in, in, in 2012, and the worst scenario in 1214, and still another war in 2020 now, uh, 20, uh, um, 2021. Only because, and bluntly speaking, bluntly speaking, only because Israel feels, apartheid Israel feels, and knows very well that it can carry out, or rather it can carry on its war crimes and crimes against humanity with full impunity. Israel is doing the same thing right now in Jenin, in the West Bank, and we, myself, I call it Gazanification of the West Bank. This is what is happening in Jenin. This is what is happening in Nablus. This is what is happening in Hebron and in Jerusalem as well. A Gazanification of the West Bank because Israel knows very well that it can carry on its war crimes and crimes against humanity with full impunity. The American veto um, in the United in Security Council, rather, is always there. It's always ready to protect Israel. The spineless European Union is always there to strike more military deals with apartheid Israel. And, and, and I would say that the right description for, you know, this Western support, Westerners in general, 
to to let you know and I know let me not talk about you know westerners I just want you know people who are familiar with western history to imagine scenes from the German city of Dresden in the second world war this is what we are talking about literally more tons of explosives were dropped on Gaza in 2021 in 2014 so imagine the same É, como uh, avisou o professor Heidereit no começo da palestra dele, a conexão na faixa de Gaza é muito difícil. Ele está fazendo essa palestra usando um gerador para energia do computador e uma bateria para energia da internet. Uh, então ele avisou que ele poderia eventualmente cair durante a aula, mas a gente vai aguardar e se comunicar com ele por WhatsApp, esperando que ele volte. É só a gente ter um pouco de paciência que que ele volta. E hum, acho que faz parte também a gente entender que na faixa de Gaza o fornecimento uh, da, da, da energia elétrica é muito, muito escassa e é tudo muito difícil mesmo. E agradecê-lo né, mais uma vez por fazer essa, esse esforço. Então eu vou me comunicar com ele para ter uma previsão, né, saber o que, que ele diz e pedir paciência para quem estiver assistindo, aproveitar para tomar uma água, pegar um café... Ok, wonderful, thank you. Bom, então ele já está, ele já está voltando. Luiz, acho que ele está entrando na sala. Sorry, Arlene, are you there? Wonderful. Thank you very much. We're all, we're all, all ears. All right. Okay. Um, I must apologize. You know the story with electricity in Gaza due to the siege imposed by Israel. And, uh, you, know, you know, we get interrupted all the time. So sorry about that and apologies. So I will just go on where, 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 from where I stopped when I started talking about, you know, that comparison between the scenes that we have here in Gaza, especially after, during and after the, uh, the wars of aggression uh, launched by apartheidism. And as I said, in 2009, uh, 2012, 2014, 20, uh, 2021, and, um, and as, as I said, uh, the scenes can be compared to those of Dresden after the Second World War. But I would say it's even, believe me, it is even worse 
judging from the pictures I've, I've seen of Dresden. Um, at the moment, as I speak to you, you know, after all these four massacres committed by Israel, there are about 60,000 houses and institutions completely destroyed, by the way, by, by, by the Israeli war machine. That included, uh, the, you know, houses, the houses I have been telling you about, that includes part of the Islamic University. In 2009, they attacked academic institutions. The library of Al-Aqsa University, where I teach, parts of the main campus of the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, legislative Council, uh, the Legislative Council building, police stations, schools, UNRWA schools, United Nations schools for refugees, um, tens of mosques, and on and on. Uh, in March 2000, at the end of December, I think it was the 27th of December, uh, 2000, 2008. But in March of that, of that, of that year, Israel gave us a rehearsal a rehearsal of what would happen to us by attacking the Beit Han the village of Beit Hanun in the northern part of Gaza and Jabalia area. And I remember very well, very, very clearly that time that Matan Vilnai, uh, who was the deputy minister of war, I remember very clearly what he, what he said at the time. He threatened us with what he called a bigger Shoah. Shoah means a Holocaust. And nobody can use this word, you know, out of fear of being accused of anti-Semitism, etc. But at the time, it was the defender who used that word in Hebrew. He said, if the Palestinians of Gaza go on, you know, resisting us, etc., etc., we would launch a Shoah, a Holocaust. They would expose themselves to, to, our, to, to our anger, our wrath. And he called it a Shoah. And I think, you know, at the time, it didn't, what he said at the time, and what apartheid Israel to the people of Beit Hanun and Jabalia did not provoke the necessary outcry from the international community. So it was a rehearsal. Israel wanted to test the water of the international of the international community. And the international community did absolutely nothing. And uh, I think, you know, what happened in, in March 2008 should have expressed, you know, like an, an alarm. Uh, when, when someone talks about carrying out a Shoah, a Holocaust, it should ring a bell. And the inter the, especially the West, you know, should say, no, that did not happen. So Israel got the message. That's my point. Israel got the message that the international community wouldn't do anything if the Israelis carried out a bigger Shoah, uh, a bigger crime. And that's why they can, came back in December or rather on December 27th uh, 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 of the same year, 2008. And the international community did nothing at the time after that massacre, after they attacked Gaza for, for 22 days. And uh, the Israelis thought it was easy for them to come back in 12 in 2012, in 2014, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you talk to people, uh, here in Gaza, now as I'm speaking to you, people would tell you Israelis might come back tomorrow because we know very well that it can carry out its crimes with full impunity. What is there to stop them? What is there to stop apartheid Israel? And the answer is nothing. The international community has done absolutely nothing. The, I mean, some people might ask about, you know, the Arab world. Um, Arab summits where um, uh, Arab presidents meet produce absolutely nothing but empty rhetoric. 
UN Security Council resolution, for example, 1860 at the time, means absolutely nothing. It means nothing. It called on both sides to stop attacks, as if you have two equal sides here on the ground here in Palestine. Israel never, never committed itself to UN resolutions, especially United Nations Resolution 1860, which called on Israel to stop its attack on Gaza. And this is why we in Gaza, we have lost faith in the official bodies of the international community. When you talk to people about, you know, international community, United Nations, Secret Council, people take it as a joke. We have been hearing the same rhetoric since 1948. Uh, people have lost faith in the European Union. And I'm talking, by the way, about the official bodies of the international community. I'm not talking about civil society. I'm not talking about ordinary people, ordinary citizens such as yourselves. I'm not talking about university students, academics, uh, labor unions, churches, mosques, even synagogues. No, I'm referring to the official bodies of the international community, the European Union, UN Security Council, Arab League, Organization of the Islamic Conferences, uh, Conference, and so on. So I think, I think the popular sense that here on the ground in Gaza that we have been left alone is correct. I think it is the overwhelming, uh, you know, it, it's a feeling that you feel uh, whenever you talk to people here on the ground in Gaza, and I think that it is spreading to the to the West Bank as well. I mean, but there is a form of resistance. And this is why people understand that the only way forward is resistance. Uh, during the massacres, in, in, um, it's including the last massacre, not a single Arab country intervened. I mean, I can tell you the best example of solidarity in 2008, 2009 came from Latin America. From where you are based now, it came from Venezuela. It came from Bolivia at the time. At the time, they decided to severe their diplomatic ties with apartheid Israel. They did that. Uh, the, the South African parliament last week decided to reduce its diplomatic uh, representation in, 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 in Tel Aviv as a result of popular pressure from ordinary people but the question that people here in um, in gaza uh, in in particular of course in gaza and in palestine in general is why i mean why did um, apartheid israel have uh, to target children i mean children i mean the last war of aggression I mean, left 69 children, you know, did in 2014, more than 460 children were left dead. Women, ordinary women walking in the street. I am an academic. I'm, I'll tell you, I've lost students. I remember very well, I can mention the name of one of them who was my, I mean, she was a brilliant student. And um, in 2009, she was walking on the street and she was targeted by a drone, an Israeli drone. Uh, people couldn't find a piece of her body, Ma'athir. Her name was Ma'athir. I mean, deliberately targeting women and targeting children in broad daylight, by the way. Broad daylight, walking on the streets. I mean, at the time, as I said, they killed more than 400 children. And then also 120 women. Old people. In the last massacre, 95, 95 old people, 16 medics, four journalists, five foreigners, you know, foreign nationalities. 85 to 90 percent of those who were killed were civilians. Were civilians, pure civilians. Um, if this offensive has done something, I would say it has succeeded in radicalizing people here in Gaza and strengthening the will to resist the occupation. And let me remind you, Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people is multi-tiered. What you have in the West Bank is a direct military occupation. In Gaza, it's a combination of direct military occupation, turning 
transforming Gaza into literally, literally a concentration camp. G Gaza has seven gates, seven crossings. Six gates are controlled by apartheid Israel. The seventh gate, the Rafah crossing, the only exit to the external world for us Gazans is the Rafah crossing. And uh, it closes more than it opens. It is controlled by the Egyptians, who definitely, I mean, um, played in a way a role in tightening the siege um, um, at, at the time. People now have understood that this is this is the end of negotiations with apartheid Israel. 1993, the official leadership of the of the Palestinian people, the Palestine Liberation Organizations, initiated talks reaching a deal, the Oslo Accords with Apartheid Israel, they were promised of um, having final status negotiations and establishing, they thought that they would be able to establish an independent state by 1999. That didn't happen, and that will never happen, by the way. And I will talk about that in detail more um, at the end of this of this class. But it is clear now for all people here on the ground, and I'm sure for anybody following the developments here on the ground, and it started, of course, with the late Edward Said, who attacked negotiations with apartheid Israel. So, you know, there is a sort of an imbalance of power, and these negotiations are not going to lead us anywhere, but, as Edward Said said it, but to surrender. But I want to talk more uh, about our, you know, our daily life here in Gaza, where people also suffer from, uh, because I promised to do that, uh, people suffer from, I can tell you, I mean, contamination of water, uh, polluted air, contamination of water, air and soil. 97 to 98% of Gaza's water is undrinkable undrinkable not even for he, for animals by the way medical conditions uh, due to injuries from i told you israel has been using internationally prohibited weapons now uh, by using these these internationally prohibited uh, weapons we have you know terrible injuries here um, so you have injuries resulting from these weapons you have on the other hand, you have water contaminations, and these injuries cannot be treated because of the siege. So the medical conditions are worsening day by day. Israel also um, prevents many other necessities. I mean, things you cannot imagine, things that people cannot imagine. From And I remember at the time when they decided to impose uh, the siege, uh, they decided to ban light bulbs for example light bulbs uh candles um matches books refrigerators shoes clothing mattresses uh sheets uh cigarettes uh, blankets tea coffee sausages flour cows pasta um fuels pencil pens papers now we are getting some definitely Definitely. But that is, you know, at the beginning of the siege, this is what we suffered from. Um, there are so many necessities that we cannot find in the market right now. Add to this, as you must have noticed, the drastic cuts, you know, um, in, um, in electricity and the drastic cuts, even our salaries, you know, even our salaries. We are not getting, you know, our proper uh, salaries, uh, not to mention the constant closure, as I said, of the of the Rafah crossing, uh, which is again to remind people the only exit that we have to the external world. All of this has led to one of the highest unemployment rates and poverty on the face on the face of the earth. One of the highest unemployment rates, and in spite in spite of um, Israel's um, alleged union because some people say well Israel has has withdrawn from Gaza back in 2005 I mean this is a big lie this is a big lie Israel controls you know the airfield controls the sea controls who comes in and who gets out 
imposes a deadly blockade. So it was not a withdrawal from Gaza. It was a redeployment of the same number of troops who had occupied Gaza around the Gaza Strip, turning Gaza into a concentration camp, into the largest open air prison on earth. But Israel still alleges that it has withdrawn its uh, it has drawn its troops from from the Gaza Strip, uh, from the Gaza Strip. Um, you know, I think you know people need to talk to Palestinians. We need to tell our story. Um, us academics need to be invited to conferences even though we cannot leave Gaza. Some of us have managed to do that. Anyway, we can do things online. Um, I think even though Israel claims that it has withdrawn, uh, it still you know, controls our daily life, details of our life. I mean, for myself, in order to be able to leave, to travel from Gaza to South Africa last month, I had to prepare myself, you know, one year in advance. One year in advance in order to be able to find, you know, um, to, to, to give the proper opportunity to leave Gaza. And the last time, and I mean, one month ago, it will be a time, uh, you know, to leave, uh, to leave uh, the, uh, the Gaza concentration camp. And I think... People ask why, why Israel is doing this to the Palestinians of Gaza. If you, I want to take you back to uh, 2006, in January 2006, after, uh, you know, after uh, the destruction of Iraq, the, uh, the, 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 the former president of the United States of America, George W. Bush Jr., claimed that he was attacking Iraq in order to spread democracy in the Middle East. And he wanted to start by uh, asking Palestinians of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank to go to the polling station. That happened in January 2006. People went to the polling stations and they wanted to vote. What, when they voted, they did not vote for pro-Oslo uh, powers. They voted for uh, our at the the people thought at the time that uh, it represented resistance. In fact, people voted against the Oslo Accords. It's not in support of the the Hamas movement. People wanted to vote against the Oslo Accords. People wanted to vote against the two state solution, and they wanted to send a strong message to the American administrations and administration and to the Israeli. Uh, to apartheid Israel, that they no longer believe in, you know, continuous, um, futile negotiations with apartheid Israel, that they wanted their basic rights. And because of the outcome of the elections, apartheid Israel, with the United States of America, with the support of reactionary Arab regimes, they decided to punish the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And this is why they decided to impose a medieval siege on the Gaza Strip, which is still uh, continuing. As if that is not enough, in 2017, apartheid Israel decided to become openly, openly an apartheid, uh, apartheid state by legalizing racial discrimination. And honestly, because of my experience in South Africa and because of studying and teaching American uh, literature, American civilization, I have tried, <coughs> excuse me, I have tried very hard to find out whether there are constitutions or laws in the world similar to Israel's nation basic, nation state basic law. For those who don't know, Israel does not have a constitution. It's one of the very few countries in the world, <laughs> excuse me, that doesn't have a constitution. Israel has basic laws. More than 60 basic laws of apartheid Israel 
are racist, are openly racist. The last of which was the nation state basic law, which Israel uh, decided to endorse, which aims to establish a legal basis for Jewish supremacy. As I said, I was in South Africa. Last month, I decided to visit the Apartheid Museum. I went through, you know, the South African constitution thoroughly. I went through thoroughly the modern constitution, the new, the post-apartheid constitution, and compared it to the laws, the apartheid laws in, uh, you know, last century. And then I compared apartheid laws in South Africa to Israel's apartheid laws. It's like, you know, copy and paste, copy and paste. And I couldn't find in the world, except in South Africa under apartheid, similar, of course, to Israel's basic laws, including especially the nation state basic law, which states that Israel is the state of Jews only. So what about non-Jews in Palestine? Second class citizens, if not even second class, third class citizens. And two days ago, Israel's finance minister, uh, Smotrich, Minister of Finance in Israel, he said, there is no such thing as the Palestinian nation. The Palestinian people, they do not exist. And this is a very genocidal statement to say. But this is not new. This, this is the point. This is not new. America shouldn't pretend that it is surprised. The West shouldn't pretend that this is something new. Look at Israel's basic law. Look at the statement made by Israel's Prime Minister Golda Meir in 1969 after the 1967 war. You can find that on YouTube, by the way. When she was asked about the Palestinian people, she says it was not as if there was a Palestinian people and that we came and we dispossessed them. No, there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. So our very existence is being denied. So I found laws actually in South Africa and the American South in the eras of slavery and segregation. That's it. That's it. So this is what we have here in Palestine. So this, in a way, I mean, makes it easier for us to understand why Israel has this genocidal tendency, <coughs> excuse me, towards the Palestinians of Gaza. So as if 16 years, now it's even 70, 16 years of blockade interrupted by four genocidal wars, wars is not enough. That is not enough for apartheid Israel. Never before, and I know that the students attending this class are conscious students and they know that they know before population, the, the basic requirements for survival. We are calling for our basic basic requirements for survival as a deliberate policy of colonization. I mean, Israel is a settler colony. Let's compare that to other settler colonies. I mean, I, as I said, I always like to compare it to South Africa. I have been having discussions with, you know, high profile anti-apartheid activists from, you know, the likes of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson, uh, Mandela Mandela, with whom I had a meeting last month, uh, my friend, uh, Comrade Ronnie Kassrels, uh, he was the Minister of uh, uh, um, Central Agency of South Africa after uh, after uh, apart after the end of apartheid. So it never, never in the history of apartheid did the apartheid forces attack Soweto, the black townships with uh, uh, Apache helicopters, F-16s, Merkava tanks, etc., etc. That never happened. And this is why the likes of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when he visited us in, uh, in Palestine, in Gaza, in fact, he said, this is far worse than what we witnessed under apartheid. Ronnie Kassar is my friend, 
and he was one he was one of the leaders of the SACP, the South African Communist Party. Um, he said, well, apartheid was like a picnic. Apartheid was like a picnic. Of course, I understand the exa exaggeration, but compared to what Israel is doing to the Palestinians of Gaza and, and, and the West Bank. So never, never before a population has been denied, you know, basic requirements of survival, as I said, as a deliberate policy of colonization, occupation, and apartheid. But this is what apartheid is, is, is Israel is doing to us, Palestinians, and Palestinians of Gaza in particular. 2.4 million living in a very tiny strip, making Gaza the most densely populated area on earth. 2.4 million people living without a secure supply of water, without enough food, without electricity, without medicines, with, that, with, with almost half of, of us, population of Gaza, children under the age of 15. Children under the age of 15. Almost all of my students know other life without occupation, without apartheid, without a blockade, without a blockade, a deadly blockade. So now, you know, the questions that, 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 that we need to discuss together is what to do. What to do in order to bring this injustice to an end. And I, I, mean, I mean, I have suggestions. We Palestinian civil society have suggestions. If people would like to learn from history, if people would like to heed our call as a civil society, I'm talking about civil society, I'm talking about academics, I'm talking about labor unions, I'm talking about churches, I'm talking about women, women unions, I'm talking about university students, etc., etc. The support of the international community, definitely civil society, uh, that the outside world has to intervene. And this is why we issued a call back in the, we, the civil society, issued the BDS call, calling on the international community, uh, you know, to boycott apartheid Israel, to uh, divest from apartheid Israel, from international companies um, benefiting from uh, Israel's uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and imposing sanctions against it, against it. Uh, and, and, and no wonder then that, uh, you know, leading anti-apartheid activists, as I said, uh, from um, Kathrad, Ahmed Kathrada to Desmond Tutu, you know, compared uh, what Israel is doing to us, to apartheid South Africa, and also they supported, and they still support, our BDS call. Uh, we have reached the conclusion that um, that our fight uh, on the popular, uh, you know, resistance front can pose a serious challenge to Israel's system of occupation, colonization, and apartheid. Popular struggle, including BDS, and this popular struggle on the ground here in Palestine must be accompanied by a global campaign. Of, uh, of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. So in other words, in South Africa, um, if you go back to South African political literature, they talked about four pillars of the struggle, four pillars of the struggle, the armed, armed resistance, uh, political underground, political underground between South Africa and the outside world where South African activists also lived, and then uh, mass mobilization, mass mobilization. And the fourth one was a global campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And I think in Palestine now, and in Gaza, of course, we are approaching our South African, our, our South African moment. 
um, and this is why we have issued our call back in 2005, Palestinian civil society, Palestinian society in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, and Palestinians living in exile in the diaspora as, 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 ref as refugees. And I think this is why we do need, we do need ordinary citizens of the world, including our, our friends in, in, in Brazil, Latin Americans, South Africans, Africans, uh, Indians, etc., etc., to show Israel that, that you are watching and that you don't like what you are seeing. This is what happened in the 60s and 70s um, and 80s against the apartheid system of, of, um, of, of, of South Africa, that people watched and they decided to act. Ordinary citizens of the world can act. They can choose what to buy and what not to buy. They can choose whether to have academic ties with Israel's academic institutions or not. Singers can choose whether to sing in Tel Aviv, entertain apartheid or not entertain apartheid. Singers and cultural figures chose in the 70s and 80s not to entertain apartheid in South Africa and not to have gigs and concerts in the Sun City. Sun City. Concerts attended only by white South Africans. And the concerts that singers have in apartheid Tel Aviv are exclusive to Israeli, uh, Israeli citizens of Israel. I cannot attend these, um, you know, these concerts and gigs. And I think this is extremely important for people. You know, the, the South African lesson is important for people to learn from. This is exactly what the global anti-apartheid, you know, campaign managed to do in, as I said, in the 70s and 80s of last century, until, until the inhumane apartheid system crumbled. And in case, and I know, I know that many people and many of the students now are preparing questions about, you know, uh, BDS and what is BDS, et cetera, et cetera. And well, BDS is a civil society initiative right from the beginning. It has always been. We issued it in 2005. We, the victims, we Palestinians, the victims of this multi tiered system of oppression, occupation, colonization, and apartheid, are fighting, <coughs> excuse me, are fighting on behalf of the community for the rule of law. The BDS movement, and I'm a member of the BDS movement, I am a volunteer, a BDS volunteer. What we are, what we, we are saying, what we Palestinians are fighting for, you know, our basic, our basic rights, rights that are guaranteed by international law. The occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is illegal. Settlements, Israeli, Jewish, Jews only, Settlements in the West Bank are illegal, are against international law. The United Nations Resolution 194 grants me the right as a refugee to return to the, to, to the village from which my family was with the other vill villages was uh, ethnically cleansed from. So namely, we are fighting for the implementation of United Nations 19 resolution calling for right of return and the end to the occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and equality, equality, end of racist laws implemented against third Palestinians. So we are not calling for, as a BDS movement, we're not calling for, uh, you know, a political solution, etc. No, no, no. We are calling for implementation of rights. Of course, there must be a political solution. Of course, there must be, but that is something else. We are calling for, you know, rights, basic human rights. Now, in response to questions and, and, and queries sent by activists, and I'm sure you have the same questions about, you know, international, international conferences, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together, etc., etc. Um, 
I think it is important to understand that if you want to support the victims of settler colonialism, whether it was in South Africa, by the way, or in uh, Algeria, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I mean, you need you need to heed their call. They are supposed and expected to lead the movement, not to be led by outsiders. And I think this is very important. I mean, you know, because unfortunately, some people, you know, try to lecture us on the best, on the best way forward. We looked at the South African experience. We looked at the, their BDS guidelines. We looked at their definition of normalization. And then we learned our lessons. And in fact, I can give you an example. B uh, South African BDS called for blanket BDS, anything that was white at the time. Now, in Palestine, we are calling for institutional BDS, institutional boycott. We want people to boycott Israeli institutions, the institutions that benefit from Israel's violations of basic human rights. We are very clear. We are very, very clear about that. And I think it is important for people to understand so that when we, Palestinian civil society, issued the call in 2005, we were counting on people of conscience. Rather than governments and complicit corporations, we were counting on you, students, academics, workers, uh, you know, um, churches, etc., etc. Most of us, and I remember that very well in 2005. Most of us argued that we needed, and this is, by the way, this is what we learned from South Africa again. We needed to address ordinary people. At the moment, we cannot bank on official bodies of the international community. But we are making a move there, by the way. Still, we are making a move. But initially, in 2005, we understood and by the way, we consulted our South African comrades, and they said you need to start by addressing ordinary people buying, you know, Israeli products uh, in supermarkets. You need to address artists, cultural figures, academics such as yourselves, athletes, you know, sports people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is working. We, in fact, at the time had our definition of the international community. We are still having our definition of the international community. I remember um, hearing this even from uh, the American scholar uh, and activist, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky said, he said, there are two worlds, the world of governments and the world of civil society and ordinary, and ordinary people. Our, our international community, when I use the term international community, it consists of civil society, as I said, pension funds, churches, municipalities, clubs, music bands, universities, uh, student unions, etc., etc. We wanted to isolate apartheid Israel, the same way the international community isolated the apartheid system. We wanted to isolate Israel's um, regime of oppression, as well as corporations and institutions that are implicated in Israel's denial of our basic rights under international law, our rights under international law. And uh, our, I think, you know, of paramount importance to us Palestinians at the time 2005, and still the same thing, the same thing was making the movement, BDS movement, inclusive. Inclusive and making it anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Two sources for us, for our call in 2005. International law pertaining to our basic rights and Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are equal for us, regardless of your ethnicity, your religion, your gender, your race, etc., etc. The BDS call is based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and international law. And based on this, 
we are always confronted with questions about what would be considered normalization, for example, and what not. We worked as, as BDS and activists and, and the Palestinian BDS movement, we worked on what has become the anti-normalization criteria that were adopted by a near consensus a near consensus of the largest Palestinian civil society entities since November 2007. Since November 2007, at the first national BDS conference, we, we, we specifically uh, called for boycotting events and activities that portray the relationship of col colonial oppression, Israel's colonial oppression of the Palestinian, which is inherently abnormal. Israeli oppression of the Palestinians is inherently abnormal. And the colonial, or rather, rather the relationship of colonial oppression um, as something abnormal, as if they were normal. So any activity that brings Palestinians and Israelis, and it portrays this relationship as something normal, must be boycotted because colonial oppression by nature is inherently abnormal. We argued at the time that this kind of activities contribute to whitewashing Israel's crimes. Still it does from occupation to apartheid to settler colonialism, etc., etc., against the Palestinian people. And uh, as I said, inspired by the South African anti-apartheid model, we went further. We went further after consulting also with our South African friends, after learning from their struggle against, uh, against uh, apartheid, we went further and issued what became the boycott guidelines to guide people because people kept asking us, what can we do? What can we do to support you? And we said, okay, boycott apartheid Israel, but there are also you know, guidelines to guide people who have heeded our call, who want to support us all over the world, including in Brazil, and to counter, you know, years of fake and false peace negotiations. They were not real negotiations. We never had two equal parties negotiating here. And that led unfortunately, to misrepresentation of what was happening on the ground in Palestine, that there was peace here. And then people started saying, why don't you get together, sit at the negotiating table, table, table etc., etc. There was no peace. There has never been peace in Palestine. There has always been colonial oppression. But unfortunately, that facade, false impression, created what became what Edward Said called peace industry, peace industry, and its culture of normalization. That, you know, business, you know, business as usual uh, here in Palestine. And all people have to do is to break the psychological barrier. No, there was no psychological barrier in South Africa. There was racism, there was oppression, there was apartheid, there was a crime against humanity. That is what it is. What is happening to us here in Gaza is a form of collective punishment. And according to international law, it's a war crime. And it has to be dealt with as such. So those normalizing projects, you know, that bring people together, you know, from Israel and Palestine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, had, had to some extent given this false impression of symmetry, of parity, balance between the oppressor. And by the way, um, you know, I must interject here, and uh, I am a fan of Paulo Ferreri, you know, pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed. I am a fan of Paulo Ferreri. And while we were walk, working on our BDS call, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I, <laughs> I, I read Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in addition to Franz Fanon's writing, The Richard of the Air, Black, uh, The Richard of the Earth, Black Skin, White Mask, etc., etc. And this really helped us formulate 
um, that um, relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed. And this is why we reject any project that brings us with Israelis that portray what is happening as something normal. Those project, projects that you know I told you about that give the false impression that you have symmetry, you have parity between the oppressor on the one hand, Israel in this case, and the oppressed, us Palestinians, this has to be boycotted. Years of negotiations between us, between them and our, represented, our representatives have obfuscated in a way the line separating colonizers and colonized and made them both look equally, the colonizer and the colonized, made us look equally responsible for the so-called conflict. Even the word, the term conflict itself, unfortunately gives the wrong impression that you have two equal parties. So in a way, Israel's multi-tiered um, system of oppression, namely occupation, colonization, and apartheid, at the time had been reduced to a conflict. And this for us, Palestinian civil society, society, we said enough is enough. We believe that it is intellectually, intellectually dishonest and morally reprehensible. These are the words that we used at the time, intellectually dishonest and morally reprehensible, and any project that promotes them ought to be boycotted. BDS, and I must say, because some people think that, you know, BDS is dogmatic. No, BDS as a movement is undogmatic, as, as I said, as claimed by some. It made it absolutely clear that it welcomes cooperation with those Israelis, uh, and, and this is important, we are prepared to cooperate with Israelis who recognize our basic rights under international law. And let me repeat, let me reiterate, we are not dogmatic. We are prepared to work together with Israelis who recognize our basic rights under international law, including our right of return. And the second condition that this cooperation must involve a form of common struggle, co-resistance. In that case, we can cooperate with Israelis. And this is why we have an Israeli movement uh, called BDS from within that has Israeli activists who work hand in hand with us. They have heeded our call for BDS and they join us in our you know, projects of uh, resistance in a form we call common struggle and co-resistance against Israel's oppression of the entire Palestinian people, the entire three components of the Palestinian people, 1948, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and, and the diaspora. Now that is clear. And let me add one last point. Uh, contrary to the false claim made by some people, some uh, liberal voices, including, unfortunately, well-intentional individuals, BDS does not target individuals. I've already said this. We never target individuals. We never target identity. Identity, individuals, that's something that we are not targeting, but rather institutions. Institution, institutions that are implicated in Israel's systematic violations of Palestinian human rights. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I don't know how long I have been talking, but uh, I'm not sure whether I have enough time to address, um, you know, the issue of political solutions. Um, I'm sure you have questions about that. And I, I, um, I will address this question if, if you have question about, yes, I talked about rights, about the basic rights, you know, the, the siege of Gaza, its occupation, colonization, etc. But I haven't talked about political solutions, and I will leave that for you, Arlene, to decide. 
Um, so thank you so much for listening to me. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Haider Eid, for bringing us this uh, class on the situation uh, in Gaza. I can't your, hear, I think, yeah, I am, yeah. Your personal account of living in Gaza and as uh, a lifelong anti-apartheid uh, uh, activist, also in South Africa, other than Gaza itself. And I will put forward the questions. Um, we have many questions. Uh, I'll begin with um, Ana Julia. She asks, what are the arguments used by the international community to resist defining Israeli occupation as an ethnic state and their actions as crimes against humanity? So what are the arguments used by the international community? Yeah, well, um, thank you for this question. The arguments made by the international community, and of course, when you're saying the international community, as I said um, in my lecture, um, we differentiate between the official international community, that is to say international bodies representing the international community, United Nations, um, Security Council, European Union, etc., and governments in general, and international civil society and um, when we um, when we issued statements um, especially when we issued the statement back in 2005 we were addressing civil society international civil society because that's what happened back in 1958 or 59 when the first anti-apartheid or rather the first bds call was made by a, a you know a handful of anc um, African National Congress, you know, activists in London, they decided to address international civil society. But, and I understand that the question is referring to the official bodies of the international community, the United Nations, the United States of America. If we are talking about the United States of America, the United States of America has an extremely strong Zionist lobby which in a way persuades using financial means, using political powers, using this and that to uh, exert pressure on the American government to keep um, or to veto any, any, any Security Council resolution that supports Palestinian rights. In fact, we have hundreds of United Nations resolutions issued by the General Assembly in support of Palestinian basic rights. If you noticed, in my lecture, I mentioned United Nations Resolution 194. United Nations Resolution 194 is supported uh, by the overwhelming majority of the governments of the world, and it supports my right of return, return to the village of Zarnuga, which was ethnically cleansed and then destroyed. But then, if it moves to the Security Council, it gets stopped and vetoed by the United States of America. And if not the United States of America, then it is the United Kingdom. If it is not the United Kingdom, then France. Get, get the idea. Arguments. Unfortunately, as I said, in 1993, the official leadership of the, of, the, of the Palestinian people decided to try another route and uh, embarked on negotiations with apartheid Israel, leading to the, uh, to the Oslo Accords signed in 1993. The Oslo Accords at that time gave the international community the false impression that Palestinians and Israelis are reaching a solution, are reaching a solution. The official leadership of the Palestinian people at the time believed, I would say naively, naively, that they would be allowed to establish an independent state. Re in 1999, reiterating what the international community itself had been saying, the two-state solution, the two-state solution. I'm sure even Brazilian, a Brazilian government, every single time you hear 
um, a, a spokesperson of a foreign government talking to us, yeah, we support the two-state solution. We support the two-state solution. And that is nonsense. We will never have an independent Palestinian state because the facts on the ground between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean lead to one state solution. There is only one state in the, on the historic land of Palestine, and that is an apartheid state led by apartheid Israel. Unfortunately, the international community and Israel come back negotiating lead to a solution, but judging by the imbalance of power, that is not going to happen. Number two, the international community, by the way, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, until the late 80s, did not heed the BDS call against the apartheid system of South Africa. It took the international community 30 years, 30 years, to start sang imposing sanctions against the apartheid system. So in a way, there was an international conspiracy of silence with the apartheid system. This is the same international conspiracy of silence supporting apartheid Israel and its colonization of Palestine, and at the same time claiming to be supporting both sides. I hope I've answered the question briefly. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you at all, at all. Found I'm muted. I, was muted. I was muted this time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have many questions. I'll put two that are connected together. So, um, oops. Okay. Uh, sorry, Arlene, there's a, there's a noise in the background. I hope I will understand your question, but there is a noise in the background. Okay. All right, so, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Gustavo Mato says, it's so frustrating to see what Israel does with US and Europe, uh, European support. Is there any other country that supports Gaza and Palestine and that can change the situation like China, for example? Uh, what can we do to help? And completing, Saraya Mislik says, uh, is there any Arab country helping Gaza in any way? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I will try to be to be very very brief. Um, first of all, um, I, I need to make it absolutely clear. I mean, Gaza is part of Palestine. Gaza is not independent at all. Gaza, as I said, has been transformed into a concentration camp. So the question. Um, it's a good question. Um, is there any country that supports Palestine in general, Palestinians? We do not have an independent Palestinian state. Uh, is there any country, any government? Yes, there are countries and there are governments that support Palestine. Uh, only last, last week, um, the parliament of South Africa passed a resolution uh, downgrading diplomatic ties with apartheid Israel. Last, last, last week, by the way. Last month when I was in South Africa, um, I had meetings with uh, some parliamentarians, some activists, some politicians, etc., including, including uh, Comrade uh, Mandela Mandela, uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson, Nelson Mandela's grandson. And every single time I had a meeting with uh, officials and non-officials, I was asked this question. All of them showed support, blanket support for our struggle, sympathy and empathy. What, this is the question, what do you want us to do? And my answer was, we want the official government of post-apartheid South Africa to cut severe old, severe old diplomatic ties with apartheid Israel. We want you to treat us the same way you expected the international community to treat you, to heed your call for BDS. And last week, the government, the, the parliament passed a resolution 
you know, downgrade, calling on the government to downgrade its ties, diplomatic ties with apartheid. We have 22 Arab countries surrounding Palestine, from Morocco in Africa to Qatar, Doha in, in the Gulf area. Only five governments have diplomatic ties with Israel. Only five governments have recognized Israel. And that leaves us with 17 Arab countries that have not recognized Israel. The Arab countries that have recognized Israel are um, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. These five countries have diplomatic representation in Tel Aviv. The rest, um, the rest of the Arab world, including governments, the rest of Egyptian people, Moroccan, are supporting Palestine. According to statistics made only last year in, in Qatar, 87% of Arabs support Palestine and BDS. 82% of Arab population are against recognizing Israel, are against recognizing Israel. Of course, when I say recognizing Israel, recognizing Israel's system of oppression, etc., etc. So, we have good diplomatic ties with the government of China. Yes, in a way, they they support Palestinians' right to independence, not necessarily to liberation. And there is a difference. You are familiar with Franz Fanon and Paulo Ferreira between liberation and and, and independence. In 2009, the government of, the, of Venezuela, followed by the government of Bolivia at the time, decided to call their ambassadors from, from Tel Aviv. So yes, we do have that support, but these governments, unfortunately, are not as powerful, as strong as the government of the United States of America, United Kingdom, etc. Notice, Notice um, when the United States of America decided to impose sanctions against the apartheid system, system in the late 80s, the apartheid system collapsed. I'm not saying it is America which made the, no, no, no. I'm saying to heed the call. Because also I need, I need to remind you, in 1986, Ronald Reagan considered the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela terrorist. terrorists. In 1989, America imposed sanctions. And this is why I'm saying we are approaching our South African moment. Um, was there another question? Sorry, or did I answer the question? Arlene? No, no you answered. Yes, thank I you. Answered. You answered. Oh, yes. Um, OK, now, um, okay, can you talk just a bit about uh, Putin and his uh, crimes, war crimes, and why Israel doesn't receive the same treatment as like Putin that might be uh, uh, go to judgment for, for war crimes? You mean Ukraine? Yes. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Putin, yeah. Right. Yeah, now this is the irony of the international, you know, the international law it's at the, and the ICC, International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, you know that Israel does not support Russia's occupation of Ukraine. I mean, the irony of ironies, the irony of the irony. But yes, I like that question because it shows hip the hypocrisy of the so-called international community. And but again, again, I need to emphasize this. The international community is controlled by the powerful governments of the West. Unfortunately, the, the European Union, Western powers, and the United States of America. Look, I mean, Russia's occupation of Ukraine, all right, illegal, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon, as soon as Russian troops entered Ukraine, the international community decided to boycott Russian sport, to boycott Russian, Russian industry, Russian uh, cultural figures, etc., etc., and even impose sanctions. And now, as you said, calling on the ICC to try uh, Vladimir Putin as as a war a war criminal. And for us, that is 
the utmost form of international hypocrisy. If you want to consider what Russia is doing in Ukraine illegal and a kind of occupation, and it is, all right, and I don't want to argue whether this we support or we don't support, but at the same time, you shouldn't have double standards. I mean, the kind of politics or the kind of policies that you are using when you talk the strong language that the United Nations, that the United States of America, that the governments of the European Union are using very, very strong language against Russian occupation of Ukraine. And when it comes to Palestine, no, 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 no. The two parties must come back to the negotiating table, table and you must find a peaceful resolution, etc., etc., in spite of the fact that Palestinians are being killed on daily basis as a result of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by apartheid as well. Right. Um, it's difficult to select the questions. There are so many. Um, okay, well, Natalia. Uh, Nat Natalia asked, well, that one was by Sabrina. And now Natalia is asking, um, okay, uh, the, the Ramadan period is, is beginning. Uh, is it true that Israeli people are teaching the Arabs? Okay, this is her, the way she put the question. She also asked. She said people are doing what? Sorry, what are what are they doing to Arabs? She wrote, she wrote teasing Arabs, teasing, teasing, See, provoking. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. She, she also yeah. asked. All right. The name of the Jewish philosopher that you quoted at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. And and, and um, yeah. Okay. Those two. Those two. I have many more. Uh. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope we don't get interrupted. If we get interrupted, please. I mean, my apologies in advance. <laughs> All right, because I really would like to answer. I know people want to know. Um, yes, today is the first day of Ramadan in, uh, in in the Arab world, in the Muslim world and the Arab world, including, including Palestine. But, uh, uh, you know, there is a misunderstanding of what constitutes Arab identity. Um, not all Arabs are Muslims. Right, not all Arabs are Muslims. Um, we are Muslims and Christians, and we have also other religions here. Sumerians in Palestine, we have Sumerians, we have Druze, etc., etc. Uh, before the establishment of Israel, about 18 or 20 percent of Palestinians were Christians. By the way, now we one 1.8 to 2 percent. By the way, are Christians as a result of ethnic cleansing as a result of ethnic cleansing. I'm talking about Christians in Palestine, Christians in Palestine. So the question is, are Israelis you know, mistreating or etc. Muslims in Palestine? Yeah, in the month of Ramadan. By the way, I'll give you just an example. Uh, most of my students, most of my friends, most of my family members would like to pray in Jerusalem, would like to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque, all right? Uh, are we still on? Are we still connected? Sorry, are we still connected? Well, oh, yeah. sorry, yeah, because I got interrupted. Yeah, um, I'll give you a personal example. I said we cannot go to Jerusalem. I live in the Gaza Strip. Uh, my sister is married in Bethlehem, not far from Jerusalem. She's uh, married in Bethlehem, and I haven't been able to visit her since 2000. Since 2000, yani for, for 23 years, I haven't seen my sister. Um, so I cannot, Bethle why did I say this? Because Bethlehem is the birthplace of Jesus Christ. So pa Chris Palestinian Christians, from Gaza are not allowed to visit Bethlehem, the, the nativity church, the nativity, you know, nativity church is based on Bethlehem. Most of you are uh, Catholic Christians and you know your pilgrimage, etc. So, so you either go to Bethlehem and Nazareth. Christians in Gaza are not allowed. Muslims, we, we want to pray. We want to pray in Jerusalem. You know Al-Aqsa Mosque and how important Al-Aqsa Mosque Dome of the Rock is the second sacred site after uh, Al-Kaaba in uh, Mecca in, in, um, 
in, in Saudi Arabia. No, we are not allowed. And now, yes, Israeli government is tightening the siege. Is not it, It's only allowing, you know, a, a couple of hundred Palestinians of Gaza. And by the way, I'm talking about the population of Gaza, 2.4 million. 2.4 million. So if you allow 100 or 200, 1,000, 2,000 Muslims from the Gaza to visit Jerusalem, compare that to 2.4 million. So yes, Israel is making our life worse and worse day by the day, including, including in Ramadan. And sorry, are we still there? Because you keep disappearing, Arlene, and coming back. Are you still there? I need a, a yes, sign. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. yeah. Uh, okay, I can hear you because you disappeared. All right. Um, and uh, by the way, um, they have been threatening us that in Ramadan we should, and this is what we are doing, we are bracing ourselves for worse times to come. Yesterday, by the way, over the last couple of months, almost every single day, they have been killing people, including today in the morning in Tulkaram, a young man was killed. Three days, three days ago, three young men in Jenin, and they said in Ramadan, it is going to be worse because they are going to send fanatic, fanatic settlers to attack Al-Aqsa Mosque itself. So this is what we are expecting today, and we are bracing ourselves for worse time to come during this Ramadan. Um, and yes, the philosopher, I'm sorry that I didn't mention the name, I think I did actually, Walter Benjamin, Walter, or Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, or Walter Benjamin, one of my favorite philosophers actually, who, who was one of the founders since we are dealing with the students now, with your students, Aline, he was one of the founders of the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School, Theodor Adorno, ben, uh, Horch, Max Horkheimer, uh, Walter Benjamin, etc., etc. So I quoted Walter Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, yes, uh, Mariana uh, Fayad asks, uh, what are <laughs> What are the political connections between Gaza and the West Bank today? What are the political connections between Gaza and the West Bank today? And there's another question that I will uh, put together. That's uh, Sabrina. How does Hamas act in protection of the Palestinian rights in the Gaza Strip? Okay. Um, the first question is about uh, the political ties, I think, between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, of course, all right. um, my understanding, um, based on this question, and then, um, the West Bank, you mean the government, the Palestinian government in Ramallah, right? Yeah. If, if, if you are referring to the Palestinian government in Ramallah and the Hamas government, since you also asked uh, about Hamas in Gaza, of course, we are ruled on the ground here in Gaza. Um, our daily life is ruled by the government of Hamas. Um, but Gaza is still occupied. Yeah, I mean, Gaza itself is a concentration camp. So you can say that this is, uh, you know, uh, an old prisoner organizing the life of the rest of the prisoners inside the prison. So Hamas is the old prisoner organizing our life inside the Gaza um, a prison. Um, of course, in, 2000, in 2007, as I said to you, after uh, the 2006 Legislative Council election in elections in which uh, Hamas won more than 60 percent of the Legislative Council seats, the government, the, the government before Hamas was led by Fatah. Fatah um, is the political uh, organization founded by Yasser Arafat and his comrades in 1965. And Fatah is the organization that controls the Palestine Liberation Organization, which signed the Oslo Accords. And they returned to Palestine, including Gaza, in 1994, and they formed a government after 1996 elections. So they had, in a way, they ruled Gaza 
and the West Bank under Israel's occupation. Because when I say ruled, managing the daily life of the Palestinians from education to municipality to health, etc., etc., without independence, without political independence, in according to the Oslo Accords, they call it limited administrative autonomy. I'm quoting limited administrative autonomy, meaning that it was weaker than the infamous Bantustans of South Africa. If you are familiar with the Bantustans of South Africa, the homeland ruled by black chiefs in South Africa, but they were controlled by the white government of apartheid. In Palestine, Israel was hoping to build Bantustans, three Bantustans in the West Bank and a Bantustan in Gaza. Now Gaza is not a Bantustan, Gaza is a concentration camp. In 2007, because Hamas had won the elections, Hamas wanted to form the government. Unfortunately, Palestinian leadership, including Fatah, they did not accept that and there were clashes. And Hamas refused to hand in power to other political forces, so there were clashes. Military clashes, armed clashes, between bloody clashes, leading to the deaths of 280 people. 280 people. There were Israeli hands, you know, divide and rule, like in South Africa, the Enkata Freedom Party and the ANC, because people say in South Africa it didn't happen. It did. Enkata Freedom, Freedom Party, it was even called by the apartheid system black on black violence. Black on black violence. Within the Palestinian context, it took the form of Fatah versus Hamas and Hamas versus Fatah. Hamas managed to win this, unfortunately, uh, domestic, I would say, internal uh, in conflict, and it managed to form a government ruling Gaza. And yes, Hamas has been ruling Gaza. This is the second question. We have no ties, in other words, with the West Bank. Uh, because they are like enemies. They have tried to reconcile endless times. And the last time was about uh, two months ago in Algeria, but on the ground, there is no reconciliation whatsoever. No reconciliation whatsoever. Um, Hamas, the way Hamas is ruling Gaza, the second question. Uh, in social, in the social life, because um, people have been asking, yeah, I mean, the, the social conduct, there is a social code that one has to follow. Strict religious code, a very strict religious code. It tried to impose, Hamas tried to impose that on people. Many people are rejecting that, but it is tough. It is definitely tough. This is number one. Number two, politically speaking, Hamas rejects political negotiations with apartheid Israel, considers it a form of normalization. But in, 12, in, in 2017, Hamas decided to change its charter. Instead of calling for a complete Islamic state on the historic land of Palestine, it decided to accept the two-state solution, unfortunately. Accepting an independent state on the 1967 borders, ultimately accepting a two-state solution. So the question is, is the model we are having in Gaza right now, which is in a way an Islamist stress strict Islamist model, but I must tell you, I mean, there are no laws preventing people from, you know, carrying on with their lives the way they like, but they tried. I'm saying they tried and it didn't work and they didn't have any kind 
of popularity. But we, sometimes in our daily contact, we need to be careful. We need to be careful not to antagonize them. But the, the worst part is that for a political movement, a resistance movement like Hamas, accepting the two-state solution after tens of years of trying it by Fatih and other political organizations. It is a, fa you know, it's a failure. It is a failure. So what to do? É, uh, congelou a imagem dele, né? Problema de conexão mais uma vez. Acho que a gente pode ter um pouco de paciência, porque tem algumas perguntas ainda uh, a julgar pelo que aconteceu da outra vez. Eu acho que ele volta. Deixa eu ver se no WhatsApp ele, ele se manifestou. Eu vou... Agora ele caiu, né? Vamos esperar um pouquinho. Bom, eu aproveito esse, essa pausa para explicar que a, o nosso cronograma do curso continua normalmente, a aula do professor Adnan, que está hospitalizado, mas está se recuperando, está bem cuidado nesse momento, ela vai ser adiada para quando ele estiver bem. Então, a, a, a próxima aula vai ser a, a aula da Tahani Mustafa, conforme previsto no calendário, que vai falar justamente do problema de sucessão na Palestina. Ela que se especializa nesse tema, ela vai nos a, ensinar... Uh, qual é uh, o espectro né, de, de partidos políticos, de forças políticas, o problema da sucessão e também uh, os movimentos da juventude dentro da Palestina hoje. Então, a aula que vem segue normal o calendário uh, tal qual vinha acontecendo. O que aconteceu é que a gente pôde inserir essa aula por necessidade e lembrando que não tinha uma aula sobre Gaza, então entramos em contato para encontrar realmente uh, uma maneira de incluir esse tema. Vamos aguardar um pouquinho mais. É, ele está com problemas de internet. Ele está com problemas de internet, mas como ele falou no começo, é o que acontece. Quando, quando se está na faixa de Gaza, é muito difícil manter a conexão é, estável e, e, e contínua. Mas eu espero que volte, porque tem algumas perguntas ainda, e eu não quero que vocês que colocaram perguntas não tenham suas perguntas respondidas. É. Vamos esperar. Aí a Laura falando. Aliás, a editora Tabla tem um, um livro de poemas né, sobre Gaza, que foi traduzido uh, e publicado pela editora Tabla, um livro muito bonito, com poetas de Gaza. Talvez, talvez o Luiz possa trazer uma imagem do livro, né? senão fico só eu aqui. Uh, ocupando esse espaço vazio da conexão falha da faixa de Gaza. And, oh, eu estou falando em português porque eu sei que a maioria dos alunos falam português, mas eu esqueço às vezes que tem alguns que falam inglês. So for those who, who don't speak Portuguese, um, Professor Haider Aid has an internet connection problem. Uh, he's not managing to access uh, the internet, but I think we can wait a bit more. We still have 10 minutes to 12 o'clock, and in fact, if we like and when we need, this class can go up to 12.20,
according to the, the OSPID uh, um, uh, schedule. So we'll wait. Um, Uh, Luiz, estão uh, um, me dizendo que tem muita... Ah, ok. Aí. Esse é o livro que eu mencionei, publicado recentemente pela editora Tabla, chamado Gaza, Terra de Poesia. É... Tá, é, o, o Alexandre, que é o monitor, está perguntando se, se ele, ele envia as perguntas por escrito e aí o, o professor Heider responde depois. Eu acho, eu não tenho nenhum problema aqui, olha, ele já vai entrar, ele já vai entrar. Eu ia falar que eu não tenho problema em esperar até o nosso horário, né? E quem for assistir depois é só cortar esse, esse pedaço e, e assistir a sequência. Pronto. Uh, okay, so I guess I need to put a question right, uh, right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. About this again. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all, nothing to be. <laughs> uh, we, we, we were happy to have you for every, every moment that is possible. Well, um, so uh, I had a, 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 a question. Following this question, the question that I was going to ask has to do with the previous question, and it was, uh, in your opinion, Uh, what can be a solution for Palestine now that the two-state solution is is virtually dead? Okay, um, I will try to be as brief as possible, even though the question, uh, you know, needs more justice. My personal view, since you are asking about my personal view, um, I fully support a solution. Uh, I would say that calls for a single democratic state that recognizes and accepts all inhabitants of historic Palestine as equal citizens and full partners in, um, in building and developing a new shared society. Uh, a society that is free from all colonial subjugation and racial discrimination. Everyone including repatriated Palestinian refugees, would be entitled, including myself, would be entitled to equal rights, equal rights, regardless of ethnic, religious, uh, gender, sexual, or any other identity. A secular democratic state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. In, 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 in fact, what you have on the ground right now in Palestine is a single state. It's a state that is an apartheid state that is ruled by apartheid Israel. And what we need to do is to, to, to force that multi-tiered system of oppression to collapse. We need to put an end to occupation, into apartheid and into settler colonialism, leading to a democratic state, a state for all of its citizens, regardless of religion, ethnicity, and identity, etc., etc. That's, I mean, very, very briefly, very briefly. Thank you. And that answers another question that was posed about LGBTQI um, plus rights uh, uh, and so on. So that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, now, the final question, because it is at almost 12 o'clock, actually, is uh, how can, how do you think the global south, how can the global south 
help not only in a people-to-people diplomacy strategy, but in a diplomatic strategy. Can the Global South make a difference? Yeah, sure. I mean, we have an experience in history. I mean, if you remember after the Second World War with the rise of national liberation movements from Jamal Abdel Nasser, the great nationalist leader of, um, of Egypt, who in 1956 decided to, to nationalize the Suez Canal, etc., etc., working in cahoot hand in hand with the Jawaharlal Nehru of India, etc., etc., forming the non aligned movement. Um, I myself, as part of the BDS movement, we have been working almost on the same line with civil society movements, organizations, sectors in the sound, calling it the Global South Movement. Um, that civil society, of course, that can affect their governments in turn, um, trying to make those governments of the global south to start endorsing our BDS call and initiating a new anti-apartheid movement, of course, anti-apartheid, anti-Israeli apartheid movement, based on the old anti-apartheid movement. So what you have, you have the global south um, working with us Palestinians hand in hand, forming this global anti-apartheid movement and leading the global BDS movement and ultimately forcing the so-called international community, i.e. Western European powers and the, America, the United States of America, to in fact implement international law pertaining to our basic rights in, 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 in Palestine. And this is what we are doing right now at the United Nations, for example, working with the so-called, of course, other people call third world countries, etc. terms that I personally don't use, but that is for us, the global South. So we have, in a way, in a way we have our partners in India, and the coordinator, uh, the BDS coordinator is based in India. We have India, we have Pakistan, Malaysia recently, Indonesia. I have just come back from South Africa. So in a way, we are banking on the support of the global South. And that, this is the last sentence now, and that hope came from what we saw in 2001 during the anti-racism conference in Durban. I attended the Durban conference and I saw the support coming from the landless people of Brazil, by the way. Yeah, they are our partners, the landless people of, 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 of Brazil, of South Africa, the, the Dalit, the untouchables of India. We took to the street in Durban for what was called the largest demonstration after the collapse of apartheid in South Africa. And that was in 2001. And this is what we are banking on right now. And thank you. Professor Haider, I forgot one question, which I think is relevant, in fact, although it's like, you know, it's a daily life thing. But someone here asked, and I don't have the person's name anymore. Someone asked about how was it to go through COVID pandemic in Gaza? Well, at the beginning, it was terrible. It was terrible because uh, can you imagine um, a besieged population, besieged population, 2.4 million in a prison, 360 square kilometer, right? And then suddenly, at the beginning, the whole world suffered from the pandemic. We said, OK, now we are isolated. We are not going to get it. But when it started, it was terrible because at the beginning we were not allowed uh, to get the anti-corona injection um, and um, of course our hospitals are not equipped are not properly equipped to deal with this pandemic so it, the people started dying and but in fact you know the, the local government here imposed a very tight curfew very very tight you know uh, curfew on people and it worked and um, step by step, we started getting the anti, I was about to say anti-flu, because I just got it, the anti-corona uh, you know, injection. We got it from Egypt. And then Israel started allowing as a result of pressure from the international community. And because people who were allowed to go from Gaza to Israel started getting it. So, you know, Israel, Israelis didn't want to get it from Gaza, etc. You know, you cannot separate them from us. It, it's impossible. 
you know, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean and West Bank, Gaza, is a, it is impossible. So we ultimately we got it. And then now you can say we have zero cases here in Gaza. But it was difficult, definitely. Uh, hundreds of people died. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your class, for your time, for your effort uh, and engagement to be with us. Uh, there were so many questions that showed how interested people were in listening to your point of view, your analysis, your experience, and your explanations. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for everything. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah, thank, we'll, we'll, thank, we'll, thank you. Thank you. We'll, 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 and thank you to your students. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks to your students and anybody else who attended this class. Thank you so much. Bye. Ciao.